City Heritage Scavenger Hunt. Hello, let me introduce myself. I am Alan, your guide for today. This audio guide has been put together to help you around our City Heritage Scavenger Hunt and to give you some more information behind the local history you are about to discover. Before we start, it would be best if you were situated at our starting point for the hunt, which is in the Cathedral Gardens just behind Shire Hall at the top of Chelmsford High Street. At each location there will be a narration, and then at the end of this I will ask you to stop the recording and restart it once you reach the next location. OK, let's get started. You should now be at our first location, which is beside a large triangular gravestone near the south gate of the Cathedral Gardens leading into Tyndall Square. Our first clue is centred on a lady called Mary Smith. Back in 1808, Mary was a hat maker in the High Street. A shop and house were where Lloyd's Bank now stands. One night in March of that year, a house caught fire in what became known as the Deplorable Fire. Mary escaped from the fire, but died of her injuries later, along with two of her apprentices, also known as Mary. All three ladies were then buried in the churchyard and are now at rest underneath this triangular gravestone. So our first question is, what was the year of the deplorable fire? We will now move on a short distance to our next location, which is situated by the gates as we exit the Cathedral Gardens. Please stop the recording now and restart it when you have reached the next location. Thank you. We are now at our second location, looking up at a blue plaque on the right hand side of the wall, just above the entrance to the Cathedral Gardens. The man we're going to talk about now is Thomas Hooker. In 1626, Thomas was invited to come and preach in the church that is now our cathedral. He was an evangelical town preacher, and although very popular with the people of the town, very soon he was disliked by the local bishops. This was because of his modern style, which eventually led to them issuing a warrant for his arrest. To avoid this, he then decided to preach to his congregation from the other side of the river in Little Baddo, outside the reaches of the law. This only worked for a short time, and eventually he decided to emigrate with his family to the United States of America. There he founded a church in Hartford, Connecticut. Thomas Hooker from Chelmsford was the author of the Fundamental Laws of Connecticut, which were later incorporated into the first American Constitution. So our second question is, in what year did Thomas leave Chelmsford? We will now move on a short distance to our next location, which is situated at the end of the Cathedral Passage as you enter Tyndall Square. Please stop the recording now and restart it when you have reached that location. Thank you. We should now be at our next location, looking at a blue plaque mounted on the side of Shire Hall. This blue plaque is for a man called John Johnson. In 1782, Johnson was the county surveyor and instigated the building of the Stone Bridge. Nine years later, he designed Shire Hall, using the same type of stone with code stone decorations. The design was based on an ancient Greek or Roman palace. Johnson was presented with a silver cup for his work on Shire Hall in 1792, after completing the project to the satisfaction of the magistrates for less than the original estimate. In January 1800, the roof of the church fell in, and Johnson organised the rebuilding, including replacing a number of the supporting pillars, which today are still difficult to distinguish from the originals. The question is, 
In what year did Mr Johnson build the Majestic Shire Hall? We will now move on a short distance to our next location, which is situated just beside the statue of the judge on the other side of Tyndall Square. Please stop the recording now and restart it when you have reached that location. We are now at our fourth location and we are looking at the statue in Tyndall Square of Judge Tyndall. This statue celebrates one of Chelmsford's most famous people, Sir Nicholas Coringham Tyndall, who was born in Molsham Street in 1776, where there is now a blue plaque. His senior education started here in Chelmsford at the King Edward VI Grammar School, and then he progressed on to Cambridge University. In 1809, his legal career began in London at Lincoln's Inn Fields. As a young lawyer, he represented royalty in the defence of Queen Caroline during an adultery trial. Later, as Lord Chief Justice, he reformed criminal law after an unsuccessful attempt to assassinate the then Prime Minister. Throughout his career, he never forgot his native town and made regular donations to both the Grammar School and the Chelmsford Museum. The statue we see before you, designed by Frederick Chancellor, was erected in 1851 and replaced a fountain which once stood in the middle of this square. So the question regarding Judge Tyndall is, what year was he born? We will now move on a short distance to our next location, which is situated in front of the Saracen's Head Hotel, across the High Street, facing Shire Hall. Please stop the recording now and restart it when you have reached that next location. Thank you. We have now reached our fifth location, in front of the Saracen's Head Hotel, and are looking at a blue plaque for Gilamo Marconi. He came to Chelmsford in 1899 and set up the world's first wireless factory in Molsham Street. There they manufactured radio sets for sending Morse code messages mainly to be used at sea. Eventually, his company supplied the radio equipment and trained operators for the RMS Titanic. That radio equipment made in Chelmsford saved over 700 lives and changed marine safety forever. During this time, Mr Marconi worked with one of his key men called Godfrey Isaacs and he was who inspired the building in New Street of the first purpose-built radio factory in the world. Eight years later, in June 1920, this was the location of Britain's first official radio broadcast by the Australian opera singer Dame Nellie Melba. The Saracen's Head Hotel was a favourite with Mr Marconi and it was where he liked to stay when he came to Chelmsford. So our question is, in what year did Mr Marconi set up his first wireless business? We will now move down the high street a short distance to our next location, which is situated outside the front of the NatWest Bank. Please stop the recording now and restart it when you have reached that location. Thank you. We are now at location number six, and we are looking at a blue plaque mounted on number four, the high street, now the NatWest Bank. The plaque is for Frederick Spaulding Sr. and Jr. Frederick Spaulding Sr. came to Chelmsford from Danbury in about 1859 and moved to a shop at number 4 Tyndall Square. Being a self-taught photographer, he took up the new art form in the 1860s and then became the town's only professional photographer. 
His studio was above his shop where his young son grew up and he soon became immersed in his father's occupation. In 1892, Frederick Spalding Jr. moved the growing business to Number 4 High Street and built a reputation as a portrait, landscape and commercial photographer. By 1891, Frederick Spalding Jr. was well established in his Chelmsford fancy goods shop and photography business. In addition to his photography, Spalding took a keen interest in Chelmsford history and fought to save ancient parts of the town, documenting them through photographs as they disappeared. So our question for number six is when was Frederick Spalding Jr. born? We will now move down the high street towards the square in front of Lloyd's Bank. Please stop the recording now and restart it when you have reached that location. We are now at location 7, Half Moon Square in the centre of Chelmsford High Street. The name of the square comes from a small half-timbered old inn that once occupied part of this site. Before the inn was built in 1703, there were seven fish stalls and three salt bins on the site. The first licensee of the inn was one Jeremiah Gin. At that time, the conduit stream flowed under the property on its way from Tyndall Square to Springfield Road and then on into the River Can. In 1808, most of the timber-framed buildings surrounding the square were damaged by the deplorable fire, which started in Mrs Smith's milliner's shop. The inn survived but was partly pulled down in 1856 to widen the entrance to New London Road. Eventually, the entire structure disappeared sometime before 1906. So our question here is when was the Half Moon Inn built? Now you may need some help with this one, and so I suggest you look at the information boards in Tyndall Street to find the answer. We will now move again down the left side of the high street and stop outside the building that is now the RBS Bank. Please stop the recording now and restart it when you have reached that next location. We are now at location number eight and are standing in front of the RBS building looking at a blue plaque. The plaque is for a man called Dr. Benjamin Pugh, who was a surgeon and pioneer in midwifery and the inoculation of smallpox. He saved many thousands of local lives in his time. He was born in Shropshire in 1715 and eventually became an apprentice with a local apothecary. He moved to Chelmsford sometime in his 20s and married Amy in 1739 the widow daughter of Sherman Wall, a local apothecary. With the help from the Wall family, Dr Pugh inherited the land at number 26, the high street. He then had the old house pulled down and instead had in its place built the mansion house, probably in its time one of the finest buildings in the high street. Practising in the field of midwifery, In 1754, Dr. Pugh published details of his inventions, including the curved forceps and the Pugh's air pipe. In 1771, he was consulted by the then town's elders on the proposed location of the new Chelmsford prison. He put forward such powerful arguments that the prison was finally built in 1777 next to the River Can. In the fight against smallpox in early 1770, Pew introduced an inoculation program for the Chelmsford's poor, making it one of the first towns in the country to be rid of the disease. Pew moved away from the high street in 1777 to Great Baddow. 
His final residence was Milford Castle in Somerset, where he died at the grand age of 83 in 1798. So our question for this location is what year did Dr Pugh move into this fine house? We will now move on down the right side of the high street to the area short of Marks and Spencer's. Please stop the recording now and restart it when you have reached that location. Thank you. We are now at location 9 and are looking at a blue plaque on the wall next to Marks and Spencer's. The plaque is for a man called William Stuper who once ran a printer's and stationery shop on the high street close to where Marks and Spencer's are now. He decided on the 10th of August 1764 to publish a newspaper which he called the Chelmsford Chronicle. The first edition contained four pages of news and views, ranging from reports of wars and rumours to local news as mundane as a feast of florists, which took place in a public house in Great Bado. The paper was an immediate success, and within a year he had found a business partner. The format of those early newspapers was very different to those of today, in that the adverts appeared at the front of the paper, and the news in no particular order came afterwards. In the 1880s, the name of the paper changed to the Essex Chronicle, and later the offices moved to various locations on the high street, the last being the building near Shire Hall, that we knew until recently as Jessop's the Photographic Shop. The business William Stuper started in 1764 makes it one of the oldest registered businesses in the county. Historical copies of the Essex Chronicle dating back to 1783 are now available to search and view in digitised format at the British Newspaper Archive. So our question for number nine is in what year did the Chelmsford Chronicle first appear? We will now move on a short distance across the high street to the building that is now the Metro Bank, facing towards Marks and Spencer's. Please stop the recording now and restart it when you have reached that location. Location 10. We are now standing next to the Metro Bank on the corner of Springfield Road and the High Street. The old coaching inn that once stood on this site was first known as the Crown and then it later became the Great Black Boy Inn and was one of the most popular inns in the High Street. During the 17th century, coaching inns were a fundamental part of the county's transport system. The coaching inn provided travellers with space to eat, sleep and drink, as well as stabling for the horses. It was even used, in some cases, as a post office. The Great Back Boy Inn, by virtue of its great size, operated in various capacities. In the early 1700s, for instance, the inn served as a detainment centre for residents deemed disloyal to the king. Towards the end of the 18th century, the Great Black Boy Inn was overwhelmed by an influx of military personnel who were stationed in Chelmsford as hostilities between France and England escalated. In 1835, Charles Dickens, as a newspaper reporter, stayed at the Black Boy Inn and wrote an article on the local elections for his newspaper. Finding little entertainment, he also penned a letter to a friend with the opening lines, If anyone were to ask me, in my opinion, what was the dullest and most stupid spot on earth, I would decidedly say Chelmsford. In later years, he did mention Chelmsford and the Black Boy Inn in his Pickwick papers, but again he was less than complimentary 
about the location and the town. The arrival of the railway in Chelmsford in 1843 severely impeded the great black boys in trade by removing much of the passing traffic. By the mid-19th century, the Great Black Boy Inn was in decline, with various outbuildings, stables and the yard were then progressively sold off. The inn itself was finally sold in 1857 and was later demolished, leaving a gap on the high street which remained vacant for just over a decade. So, the question is, on this location, in what year did the inn disappear? Our next stop will be beside the Stone Bridge, in Stonebridge Walk. Please proceed down the high street until you reach the bridge and then turn right and stop just as you enter Stonebridge Walk. Please stop the recording now and restart it when you have reached that location. Thank you. Location 11. We are now standing beside the stone bridge. Since Roman times it is believed there has been a river crossing at this point. The first timber bridge is thought to date from the early 12th century. By 1360 this wooden bridge was in need of repair and was eventually replaced by a stone structure in 1372. A picture of this bridge still appears on the City Council coat of arms. By the mid-18th century, the bridge was in need of serious repair again. So in 1782, John Johnson, the then county surveyor, instigated the rebuilding of the bridge using some 240 tonnes of Portland stone. He designed the structure and increased the road width. To do so, he demolished some of the buildings on each side of the bridge. The decorations on the bridge were made from an artificial ceramic from Lambeth called Code Stone, of which John Johnson was very fond of. The keystone of the bridge is inscribed 1787, but the bridge was opened on 14th of January 1788. Right up until the early 1960s, parts of Baddow Road, Molsham Street, New London Road and the High Street all suffered from flooding during periods of heavy rain. Not long after, massive concrete channels were constructed to prevent the town from flooding, and these allowed walkways to be built along the sides of the river. At the same time of these works, it was discovered that the stone bridge had little or no foundations. So as part of the work, these were installed. A question regarding the bridge is in what year was it built? And so we move on to our final location on this walk, which can be found a short distance down Stonebridge Walk, above a doorway on the right to a solicitor's office. Please stop the recording now and restart it when you have reached that location. Thank you. We have now reached our final destination and you should have now discovered a blue plaque to a man called Thomas Watts high on the building to your right. Thomas Watts was a linen draper from Billericay. He was a Protestant believer in the time of Catholic Queen Mary I. Because of his religious tendencies he was accused of not attending church. He was examined on several occasions by both Justice Anthony Brown and Bishop Bonner, but neither could change his mind to attend church. Because of this, he was eventually sentenced and condemned to be burnt to death at the stake. The day before his execution on the 10th of June, 1555, he was brought to the Lion Inn by the Stone Bridge. Here he spent his last night dining with two other believers, all of whom were to suffer the same fate. Of the three condemned men, only Thomas was executed in Chelmsford at the top of the high street at the hands 
of Lord Rich, a local squire. So our final question is, in what year did Thomas die? Congratulations, you have now completed the City Heritage Scavenger Hunt and hopefully you've found all the clues and managed to collect all the answers. If you would like to check these, they can be found on the same website as you obtained this recording. There is also available at the same location a certificate for you to download to prove that you have successfully completed the challenge. If you enjoyed your trip into the past and are interested in learning more about our local history, there are a series of walks available from Chelmsford History Walks and Talks. Their website can be found on Google. Thank you for joining me on this walk and staying with me until the end. This is Alan, your guide, signing off and thank you for listening.